And what a week it's been on Rikers Island. Decrepit conditions seen up close by local leaders. You know, I've been following this story very closely myself, talking to all parties involved, the officers, those looking out for the inmates, and the leaders responsible for change. So with all of that said, let's get right to our On the Record segment. And joining me this morning, public advocate Jumani Williams. Mr. Williams, good to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Dan. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So let me get right to it, because this past week you toured Rikers Island. You testified at the city's council hearing. You've been very busy, and we've been reporting on the violence, the poor conditions for both inmates and staff. Can you recap for our audience some of the concerns that you witnessed firsthand? Uh, you know, I have to tell you, if I hadn't seen it myself, it would have been pretty unbelievable. Um, first of all, no one on either side of the bars are safe on the island right now. Uh, I visited in May, and it was bad then, you know, the things that we heard. The, the precipitous drop from May to now to an almost dysfunctional uh, system uh, was just uh, unbelievable and unconscionable. We saw people sharing uh, bags uh, as toilet bowls because mm -hmm. the toilet bowls didn't work. Some places that had no um, water. Uh, we had HIV patients saying they hadn't received their medication. Uh, same uh, people with mental health issues. We had people with wounds that hadn't seen doctors. Um, we saw people who were in sh uh, shower cell door uh, uh, used as cells. One person was naked. I don't know if it was urine or water that was dripping from them. People sleeping in filth, uh, in feces, yeah. people not getting their meals on time. We saw corrections officers who were working doubles, triples, even quadruples. Okay. We saw someone drop a weapon. Uh, it was it was pretty bad. Yeah. Pretty, I mean, pretty bad. You're laying out what is what is described really by many as hell on earth, right? And it's been described that way for quite some time. Years ago when I visited the island myself, so many plans, public advocate, to make it better. But let's be really honest here in this conversation. Is it fixable or is it just languishing until it's shuttered and closed down, which is the plan? You know, there, I think it's been described in these terms before, but anybody will tell you that this is, they, we've, we haven't been here. Maybe we were here 30 years ago or so, uh, but in, in recent times, where we are now is just remarkably inhumane. Yeah. It's a human rights crisis, a state of emergency. Rikers does need to continue to close, but we don't want to bring the culture that exists there two new systems that that won't work and so the the commissioner i spoke to commissioner shirali has some great mid-term plans mm -hmm. but we need immediate action right at this moment in time Agreed. to stop the acute stuff that's happening right so, now. so some say and you may feel this way too that releasing non-violent offenders reducing jail population is one of the immediate answers now i spoke to police commissioner dermot jay about this last week i want you to take a listen to what he had to say about it we know what happened when Rikers Island emptied out, and, and let's make sure that we do things slowly, methodically, that doesn't negatively impact the public safety in New York. Any discussion of emptying out Rikers Island is, to me, ludicrous. So, so what are your thoughts here? I agree with most of what he said, except for the ludicrous part, and we should remember what happened when we emptied out Rikers. Uh, in the 1990s, we were almost at 20,000 people. Uh, we went down to about 4,000, we're at about a little over 6,000, and we didn't have, we've never seen the precipitous, sharp rise in crime that would have been commensurate with going from 19,000 to 6,000. So we want to be clear about that. So, you know, we you have know, seen Yeah, you know, public advocate, the other aspect of this is the staff. And I recently spoke with the Department of Corrections Commissioner prior to your Rikers visit, and we spoke about officers pulling those triple shifts you spoke of because of the mass call-outs. But he says the number of officers on staff is not an issue. Take a listen here. So, yeah, there was a decline in the number of staff by 600, but there was a, a, a 5,000-person decline in the number of people incarcerated. This isn't a do-we-have-enough-people-employed here problem. It's a do-we-have-enough-people-actually- coming to work problem. So the New York Post reports 20% called out in a single day last week. Officers reaching out to me, texting me, saying they're calling out because they simply don't feel safe. What do you make of officers staying home? One, I understand. There are officers being assaulted sexually, physically. Uh, there are inmates being assaulted. The, the conditions that are there are not good for anyone. Let's be clear about that. However, we have to, one, have the DOC, the Department of Corrections, show that they're making good faith efforts to keep officers safe. And two, those are the only folks that we have right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to have them come back to work 
it is incredibly important to get to where we need to go. But back to Commissioner Shea, I want to be clear. The one thing we agree on is we have to do this method methodically, yeah. and we are. We're looking at the people who will not uh, make us safer on the outside, but keeping them in is making everybody unsafe where they, where they are now. So we are thinking about this is not something that's happening uh, willy-nilly. It's being uh, pretty methodical, actually. Tom, I want to play one more, one more soundbite for you, and that comes from the COVA union, who is actually saying that they want the mayor to resign altogether, and they're actually defending, of course, their correction officers. Take a listen here. So we have a recipe for disaster. Overworked, not being paid, single parents have to worry about child care at home. You know, this is, this is crazy. And so, so public advocate, is one of the immediate actions, would it be to hire more correction officers to help relieve some of those triple shifts? The problem with hiring new officers is that they won't be online until January. So there are 600 officers that are being hired, but they, we won't make it until January. Uh, but Benny is correct. It is a recipe for disaster. Both sides of those bars, by the way, are all black and brown. Mm -hmm. And I think if they weren't, we wouldn't be in this situation. But those officers have a lot of reason uh, to be uh, complaining and a lot of reasons to be uh, upset, as well as the people who are housed there. Yeah. And it is mismanagement, and it has been mismanagement for many, many years. Yeah, which this new commission came in and caught a, got a real problem. Which is what we've been covering for quite some time. We only have 30 seconds left. Kathy, Go uh, Governor Kathy... Kathy Hochul has hinted at state intervention, state takeover. The mayor pointing to that as well. Do you agree? Is that the course of action here? We need something. Unfortunately, neither the mayor or the governor have visited. I think the mayor himself needs to go in right now and take a look. The, uh, the governor needs to act on the Less is More Act. Uh, we do have to get some people off the island. We need to have some new folks on the island for uh, people to come back to work. We also have to make sure we're showing good faith that people are trying to make it safe. There are doors that have been broken mm -hmm. for many years. There are a lot of issues there. We need all levels turning. We also need a court system yeah. to start moving faster on trials and counting. That is a problem as well. Uh, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, you know that we are going to stay on top of it as we have for quite some time. I appreciate you being here. Thank you.